Hey, how's it going? I'm Nick, and I'm your host on the Echo Academy podcast, a podcast dedicated to uncovering helpful tools and strategies that improve your quality of life at work. On today's show, we talk about how to transition to an entirely new career. My guest today is Alexandra Young. Alex is a former professional cyclist who spent much of her athletic career traveling around the world, competing in various competitions, including the 2000 Sydney Olympics as one of only 30 mountain bikers. After which, Alex transitioned to become an engineer and also earned herself an MBA at age 39 with two kids under four in tow. If you'd like to find out more about Alexandra and this episode, you can go to echo.academy forward slash Alexandra. That's E-K-H-O dot A-C-A-D-E-M-Y forward slash A-L-E-X-A-N-D-R-A. Today's episode can be best described as a story of resilience, hope, and gratitude. I'm so happy to share this episode with you. So here's my interview with Alexandra Young. All right, Alex, welcome to the podcast. Hi, uh, it's great to meet you. Thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, before we talk about the topic in, you know, in general about how to transition to a, a new career, um, I just want, I'm, I'm really interested about your background actually in, uh, you know, cycling and mountain biking. Um, just curious, how did you, you know, decide to choose that sport and, you know, what made you fall in love with it? Thank you again for inviting me here, Nick. Yeah. Um, and it's always fun to talk about yourself. So I yeah. appreciate the opportunity. And Perfect. one of the best times in my life in terms of, you know, the most amazing thing I've done so far has been being an athlete. Great. So I have always been athletic. I was never allowed to ride a bike uh, when I was a child. And I, we lived in a busy, busy city in the middle of Toronto, downtown. And then when I went off to university in Vancouver, on the beautiful campus of UBC, University of British Columbia, I discovered the bike and just fell into the right crowd. Uh, lots of, that was right when the mountain biking was coming up. And this is around the mid 90s. And I just fell in love with it, loved, found the right friends, and eventually just got better and better. But right. it wasn't until well after university when the opportunity to ride uh, more seriously full time uh, presented itself. Well, and I imagine Canada to have perfect terrain for biking, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Vancouver was incredible for cycling. Um, unfortunately, with a lot of development and evolution, a lot of the lands that we rode on back then are gone, unfortunately, okay. in the hills on the North Shore. So, but it was a, a great time to be part of the sport. Well, I imagine yeah. so. Were, were you, did it, were you into the cold though? Because I imagine British Columbia can get really freezing. <laughs> oh, we, I've ridden through snow, through hail. Through, uh, we put chains on our, our tires to go riding in the snow. Those were probably the most fun, actually. <laughs> wow. And okay. when you're in your early 20s, nothing affects you. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> you know, YOLO, I guess, in the yeah. modern day. I'm pretty invincible. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how did it turn professional? So I had finished university and moved over to Hong Kong. I was born in Hong Kong. Uh, this is right around the late 90s, so after the handover. And lots of opportunity for young, uh, Western-educated, Hong Kong-born professionals like myself, my brother and sister, and, and lots of our colleagues as well, lots of my friends. And this was a, just the right place at the right time. Hong Kong had wanted to raise their flag at various events. So at the, the Olympics, we had our own seat at the table. So right. the WTO, the World Trade Organization, we had our own seat at the table. So there's some of these international organizations, Hong Kong wanted to keep the Hong Kong independence at that time. So they had, you know, given in funding for the culture, uh, cultural arts. Um, if you're a dancer, if you were, um, you know, a, an athlete as well. So there was opportunity to, if you were born in Hong Kong, to represent Hong Kong at some of the regional events. So we're not talking international at the time. It was regional Asian championships, Asian games. Hong Kong wanted to field a women's team. Uh, they had a new coach, a new program, and I was able to take advantage of that. 
um, the first six months, I remember they had said that there was an event coming up. And if I was willing to put the time in, it would be unpaid, um, bring your own bike. You know? <laughs> and then they had a, it was basically a camp. And there were three of us girls at the time. And it was the hardest six months of my entire life. So you imagine yourself, if you're a pretty good athlete, weekend warrior, you've got a sport that you like, and then just being put full in four hours a day, six hours a day sometimes, training, sleeping, eating, like you are, that's all you do. Right. And that was absolutely the hardest because you're just trying to hang on for dear life on some of these rides. It was us three women with about, I'd say, 20 men. And the same thing, everybody was kind of at a camp. Uh, and at the end of that, um, two of us lasted through the six months. Uh, we got new bikes and they fielded us to the to the event. It was in Asian Championships. And after the races, which were also very hard, and we didn't do great, but we I survived. Um, <laughs> and at the end of the races, I was offered a place on the team to continue training and to see where I can go to. So they saw the potential even without the, obviously the achievements were not great yet, but the potential was there to be uh, at a certain level within uh, the Asia field. So that was how I got started in cycling. And I still think it was being at the right place at the right time. Right. And one thing I always thought, like people say that I was lucky or you know, people always put a lot of their achievements towards luck. And how, what I think about luck is that you are ready for the opportunity when it's presented to you. All of us are always presented with opportunity. It's right. whether you're ready or not to take that opportunity. And at for me at that time, I wasn't that young. I was 26. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't, you know, 18 or 22. I was 26 years old. I had a degree. I could have gone to work, but I was able to take that opportunity. I wasn't married, no responsibilities, and I captured that opportunity. So that's what I think luck is. It really is being ready for any of the opportunities that are presented to you at any point in time. Yeah. In yeah, yeah I, I agree with that. But still, it must have been hard. And and I'm curious how how far. And this is not to uh, be disrespectful to your talent or anything. Mm -hmm. But how far away were you when you were, let's say, a, as you say, a weekend warrior to getting to that uh, when you first did that six month training? How far away were you from getting to being at that level of you know top athlete? Uh, very very far still <laughs> very far so i was uh, i wasn't even asian class at that time um and the japanese riders the korean riders and even at that time the chinese riders were very strong japanese were already world class uh and it was it was very difficult my first race was on the track the velodrome and i was lapped in the first three <laughs> so even after training for six months full time and everything you're you're stronger but you just you don't have the experience like you're thrown into a professional setting and i was very far away so even to me these athletes have been riding for five six years and so you wonder what how much more can you improve in your fifth or sixth years like if you do anything for five or six years as dedicated as, as athletes have to be Yes, I was very, very early in the evolution of, of being an athlete. So you almost had to improve at an exponential rate, I guess, compared to your your peers, huh? <laughs> yeah, but definitely, you know, your your greatest strides and improvement are always in the very beginning. It's when you get to the elite level, you'll spend one or two years to get to that next three to five percent improvement. So yes, I might have improved from, you know, a 30 percent up to an 80 percent. But you still aren't world class at about at that level. You need to get to the ninety percent until you're actually competitive to get you know medal contender, or are you just part of the field? So I was absolutely just part of the field and at the back of the field at that time <laughs> too. So um, I think one of the most appreciative things that I uh, that I've taken away from being an athlete is that even though I felt I was good because I'm smart, I'm Western educated, all that kind of stuff. I realized that as an athlete, you lose a lot and you lose very publicly. And being a big fish, you know, medium sized fish, maybe when I started, being a medium sized fish in a very small pond yeah. means the outsized amount of press and pressure that I felt for Hong Kong, I'm the best you got and I'm not very good, <laughs> was was hard because I'm still very proud to be born in Hong Kong, but 
I also know the rest of the world is, you know, is bigger than Hong Kong. Um, and I wasn't even that good yet. Gotcha. So failing and failing publicly was something I absolutely uh, learned how to deal with and be a bigger risk taker. Yeah. And in terms of, you know, having to find yourself on the losing end multiple times and have it be really public, was it demoralizing? Did you think about maybe this was not this was not for you? Or did you think, you know what, this is my one opportunity to, you know, pursue my passion? Looking back now, I don't know why I continued. Actually, the first two years was it was horrible. I raced in Australia, did horribly, came in last. I, went, I raced in um, around the world, actually. So we had a couple of other World Cup races or just Asian class races, and I would come in last, or I come in the last five. And I don't know why I kept doing it. Um, all I knew is that I loved, I loved training. I love training because then there's no one watching. I loved riding my bike. Like You can't do something like this if you don't love it. And I didn't know what else I would do. I yeah. didn't know what else I would do at that time. Would I go back to work? Oh, I can still do this right. for the time being. Yeah, so. sometimes the absence of options really helps. That helps a lot. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. So tell me about the uh, uh, making it to the Olympics. What what was that process like? So it was actually only my third year riding. So I, I still think it was probably too early uh, for me to, to reach these kind of successes. But it was, I, I don't know if this, the system is the same. This is for the 2000 Olympics in Sydney. So the year beforehand is the qualifying events. So you go and they have formulas of how you, what races you do and what places you get to get qualifying points. So essentially we just chase qualifying points and, and as the field does, so you pick, you know, kind of your itinerary, your training program fits to, for you to peak at certain periods, but you basically travel all around the world to participate in national championships and world cup events to eventually get enough points. And so that to me, I'm so proud of the fact that myself, as the only Hong Kong rider, was able to get enough points to be high enough on the rankings, on the, on the world rankings, to qualify Hong Kong um, to participate at the Olympics. It was the top 30 women in the world at the time. Wow, so fantastic. So it was incredible. And I still pinch myself sometimes to think that I, I did that because it, I look back at how amazing some athletes are. It's like, I didn't feel like that, but I see that it, it happened. So, right. yeah. And it, it was a lonely journey traveling. I think that was also very difficult. But then I remember there was a rider from South Africa. There was a rider from New Zealand. And so we're all these individual riders representing our countries. And so we would kind of keep together or we would see each other. And that was kind of a nice, uh, a nice community to be part of because we weren't part of the Swiss team we were part of the canadian team those were the strong powerhouse uh countries that right. had mechanics and had managers and had three riders you know we were all individual riders right you know once in a while we'd have someone fly in and help us with something but for the most part we were on our own it's interesting yeah. because um um in in one of the previous episodes of the podcast i spoke to a guy named troy and troy used to coach the uh the track and field team for the u.s olympics okay and uh, and track and field can sometimes be a very individual sport as well, and 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 we were discussing it, and I think it seems to me to be true for cycling as well, because even though it's very individualistic, um, that need to to bond as a tribe, you know, didn't I mean it didn't deter you from bonding with your fellow. Uh, fellow athletes because even though you were competing against each other it was just as important to have a to have a tribe almost absolutely i think especially being a female mountain biker as well that there's just not a lot of uh community so you you build your own community you have to find it was that difficult it wasn't it it got easier absolutely because it's still a very western sport so mm -hmm. it's very caucasian um i'm being a minority, there's no African countries. You know, the South African rider was was Caucasian, uh, was white, and so it was. I it, it got better, especially as I got better. So then you build confidence, and and you reach out to the new rider in the circuit, and you see that they're struggling. Yeah. So there was a Japanese rider who I saw once in a while, um, and so we we bonded 
it, it got easier. Yeah. So eventually you became the big sister of the group. <laughs> <laughs> for some. For for some, yes. Okay. Yeah. So how long did you s- practice? I wouldn't say practice. How long did you cycle professionally? Full time, uh, paid, uh Seven years. Seven so years. I probably cycled for nine years in total. So, you know, one or two years in the beginning, unpaid, and then nine, uh, seven years after that. Gotcha. Yeah. And at any time during the seven years, like, how did you figure out, like, it was nearing the end um, of your journey as an athlete? So after the Olympics, it was great. So that was in 2000. And I was offered some uh, contracts with some professional women's teams. So on the road in Italy and in the U.S. So I did pursue that. Now, that was a lot of fun. Um, so I, 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 quote unquote, left the national team. So in Hong Kong, for the first couple of years, first three years, it was very much, you know, 80% training and then just a little bit of racing. And then when you go on the professional side, it's actually the opposite. You do about 80% racing and 20% training um, because you, you race almost every week or every other week. So, so that was kind of the second half of my career where I was racing a lot more. Uh, but then it was a lot less structured. And this is when I realized that this is how I'd mentioned earlier. I felt like maybe I'd achieved some of those successes early because I didn't have the stability of a, a training base to carry me through some of these um, more busy race seasons. So, so anyway, I ended up racing in Italy, which was an incredible year. Um, and then racing in the U.S. for another year. And those were a lot of fun in terms of meeting other women, being on a team of women, traveling together with women, um, living in a dorm or in an apartment with women. So that was different after the first three years of just being the only woman on a men's team in Hong Kong. So after that, those couple of years traveling the world um, with a different experience, it was qualifying time again for the Olympics in Athens. And in 2003, I just remember how hard it was in in 1999 to travel the world and get your qualifying points. It's very, very lonely. And I knew my level at that time. Was I a medal contender or was I part of the field? And yes, I could be part of the field again. And yes, I could have gone to Athens. I'm I'm certain I could have qualified again. Um, But it was just at that point, I'd been doing it for seven years. I had a degree. I was an environmental engineer. I want to go back and save the world. <laughs> do I want to do this again? And so that was when I actually retired. So I was a little bit burnt out. I hadn't had a break in the seven years. And this is during my 20s and early 30s. Uh, all of my my college friends, they were getting married. I missed every one of them, their weddings, like that kind of thing. Like I didn't have a life outside right. of this. So... Even though I, I, in hindsight, what a great opportunity. Like, did I give up something too early or, or not? And then I ended up, um, I retired in 2003 because I just couldn't face another year, another full year of qualifying. But then even if you do qualify, it's another nine months until the actual Olympics. So if I was going to commit at that time, it would be committing for another two years. And now that I knew what I was walking into, that was uh, the decision, actually. It wasn't something like, oh, I had no options. It's like, oh, I have an option. I think, you know, I could go back to work. I had met a guy um, who was very supportive of whatever I did. And so that was when I realized that, yeah, maybe it was the fact that I had an option made it, you know, different yeah. the second time. Was it easy to, to, to come to that decision or was it, was it just that the impetus... Of, of really pursuing that that journey towards Olympics because because mm-hmm. technically if you think about it even if you didn't qualify for even if the Olympics was not on your radar you could have still cycled professionally right the Olympics mm-hmm. was just one race so to speak it was just one race but I was still heavily invested in the Hong Kong national team I wouldn't have kept riding if I didn't go to, to the Olympics got it to me, I, that wasn't an option in my mind, actually. You know what? That's probably the first time anyone has mentioned that. So I didn't think of it that way to continue just riding as a professional. Because as an athlete, the Olympics, is, to me, is still the, 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 the highest level. It's not like um, the NBA or the um, 
or hockey where the Stanley Cup is absolutely more important than the Olympics or Wimbledon is more important than an Olympic medal for some athletes. Yeah. For cycling, I still think the uh, the Olympics is, is the pinnacle of your sport. It's true. Yeah. And I think sometimes myself and we as common folk, <laughs> uh, what we don't realize is that there really is a no there really is no breaks when you're an athlete because it's unlike other jobs where you know you can take a mental break you know when you're an athlete you know every time you take a break your physical your physical capabilities almost decrease so to speak and i and and i i'm i'm a huge fan of the nba and that's uh, one thing uh, uh uh lebron james always says right he says um that the off season is the hardest part for me because it's the easiest time to want to focus on all your other your other dreams right you know being in movies having a production company all those things but knowing that when you come back to the nba season you know you got to you still have to perform at your best so the off season is always harder than i would say that's true as an athlete when you're in training when you're in in season you know what you're doing every single minute of the day you wake up you eat you train you rest you train some more, you rest <laughs> some more, or you play. Like it's so structured, and having the unstructured opportunities of so many other things, like that's very tempting, it very is. very tempting. And so that was a, a choice that I had made. That I knew that if I if I was going to continue, I wanted to go to the Olympics. But then, do I want to commit for another two years? And at that point in time, I the decision was no, um, unfortunately. So if I had other opportunities to maybe take four months off and really focus on other things then and then come back then maybe my decision would have been different gotcha mm -hmm. and i think you alluded to it actually but um to ask the question more specifically uh when it came time for you to retire i mean how did you feel i mean did you know what you were going to do next were you nervous i think that was probably i did not know what i was doing i do believe that that was the hardest point in my life so even though i'd mentioned all oh, the six months of when i started riding that was a career change in some ways right deciding to do this or thinking that you could do become an athlete that was physically difficult when i came out of cycling i was in my early 30s um i didn't know what to do i'd been out of engineering for seven almost nine years actually uh, I remember when I entered engineering or entered uh, the sport nine years beforehand, AutoCAD, the programming that we did was still in 2D, in two dimension. I came out, it was in like three dimension, but it had movement and it was like four <laughs> dimension. I didn't know how to get back into it. So no, I was absolutely lost um, in terms of, you know, what, how do I get back into it? And I, I do believe a lot of athletes face this. And I had achieved some successes, but I wasn't a household name or anything like I was a bit famous. So even though I had this on my resume, how do you translate that into something that's just almost like a nine to five job again? I didn't want to stay in the sport. Um, I didn't want to become a manager or, uh, um, you know, I didn't want to stay in the sport of, of elite cycling. And so, so the options, I don't think the options are limited. The options are as limited as you believe. So as long as you feel like it's open, then obviously it's as, as wide as you want to make it. Right. So. so so how did you begin thinking about that transition? Like did you um did you think about uh what I wanted to do and how to get there or did you think like oh who can I reach out to what, how should I think about this transition? I did return back to environmental work. It wasn't environmental engineering then. Uh, and absolutely, I reached out to a lot of people. My sister-in-law actually was incredible. She was a journalist. And at one point in her time, she was an environmental journalist. It was oh. great. So she had introduced me to countless people. She's invaluable. And I looked into getting a law degree, getting my master's, a law degree, MBA, um, public health urban planning, like, oh, what can I do? I know I need to do something else. Buy me some more time <laughs> before I really go back to work. So so I did, I went to all the tours around the universities, the local you know, excellent universities that we had, interviewed at a couple of them, applied to a couple of them. So all the time I was working um, in environmental, uh, an environmental job, it was still kind of a stepping stone. I bought myself probably two years of time looking for something else. 
Right. Yeah, two years is, uh, I guess, a good amount of time to really at least have something grounded while you think about what you want to do. Was there anything you consciously uh, thought about or planned out, you know, in terms of preparing for your transition? I didn't plan anything at all. Um, I really, I think I was lucky in terms of just, you know, being persistent and looking for work. I, I must have sent out countless resumes and I don't know, you know, entering the workforce again after all of these years without a lot of experience, the pay was like, I can't even tell you how little pay I was getting at the time because I was being paid as a new, um, uh, new graduate. Mm -hmm. And it was embarrassing with an engineering degree at mid, you know, almost mid thirties at the time, like I'm only making, you know, very little money. <laughs> yeah. So that that was difficult and it was embarrassing. But and I will actually say I felt like I was hiding, you know. So I didn't I didn't talk the first five years after I finished after I retired. I did not talk about cycling. I didn't catch my bike. I didn't. Nobody knew. Everyone thought I I rode my bike around the world or something. But I didn't talk about the elite side of the cycling. So it was a good place to hide. Um, it was difficult. I you're you're a little lost. Because you're in a different, I was also in the U.S., away from Hong Kong, away from Canada, where I grew up. So nobody knew me. So it was a good place to hide, I think. And that was how I coped with transitioning out of, of cycling. So you preferred to hide? Was that I the thought, question? Yeah, I would actually okay. absolutely say that I was hiding then. Consciously or unconsciously, that's what I ended up doing. And that's probably how I, in some ways, um, pers persisted through that transition period. It wasn't a one month, six month, or even a year thing. To me, I almost feel like it was, you know, three, four years. Why, but why did you feel like it was important to hide? I don't think it was important. I, I think it's it's how I coped gotcha. in terms of, um, did I, I don't think that I was consciously hiding, but I, at the time, I didn't talk about it. A lot of it is because I didn't win a medal. I only went to one. Yeah. It, like I, it was all those excuses you give yourself. Like, you know, I yeah. was okay. I wasn't great. Um, so it, it took me many years to realize afterwards is like, yeah, that was pretty cool. Like the, Absolutely. My comfort now on how I talk about it and the pride I have for it now is so much different than what it was year one, year two after finishing. Yeah. yeah. I, I imagine. Yeah. But I mean, it's 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 interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and and I think you 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 brought up a good point because whenever we transition to a new career, it it's almost like we compartmentalize all our other achievements mm -hmm. because it has almost no relation to what we're doing now. And sometimes I wonder if if that's a good or a bad thing, you know? Because it, um, you know, sometimes you know you you hear all these, um like top athletes who says like uh, whatever you've won in the past means nothing now. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Sometimes yes. some sometimes it's good to remind yourself of, of of just of of all the mountains you scaled and and all the accolades you've achieved just to give yourself that self confidence, right? I a hundred percent agree. I think it is very difficult, you know, when you're living in the day at this time, it only matters what you're doing now. Whereas absolutely to be able to cope with the challenges you're facing every day is like, oh, I, I got this. I know I can do this because you know, I've done it before or I've done other amazing things before. So I got this. I think in order to have that um, maturity to not be scared and not be uh, non -conf you have to be confident. In order to get that confidence, it's you build on everything else in the past. Right. So, yes, I agree. I, and this is probably one of those things about as people get older, nothing phases them anymore. I love sure. that because maybe I'm getting to that age <laughs> yeah. now where it's like, I've done all these things that have yeah. been really hard. And I don't know if I can do it. And I'm not very good at it in the yeah. beginning. But I got it. Yeah. I can do it. Yeah. Well, it's a testament to your human spirit. I mean, anything you've done, you've accomplished. So, I mean... But having said that, um, is there anything that you feel you could have done better during that transition? During the transition, I think if I had had more fun about it, I definitely think um, like we're just talking about right now, it's just like, I got this. Yeah. 
I can do this engineering work. I'm yeah. not that old. You know, I was 33 <laughs> and I was working. Did you feel old? Oh my gosh, yeah. I was 33 years old, I remember, and I was working alongside 22-year-olds. Smart, fun, you know, they're having fun and they don't know how to figure out this pump that we were trying to figure out how to use, but they were having fun doing it. And I was thinking, oh man, I should know how to do this. I was like, no, just go figure it out. I think that having more fun in life in general, I think mm. is is what I've learned. And right. I wish I had a bit more of that, just you know, not being so scared all the time, not being right. thinking that, oh, because you did one thing, um, you have to know everything else. Or because you didn't do something, you won't figure it out. Like, it's just about just go figure it out and know that you can. Do yeah. It. I think that's huge. Right. And, and I want to touch upon this point because I, I, I wasn't thinking about it, but now that you mention it, because most career transitions happen mid mid career, I would mm -hmm. say. So, ageism must play a, a big role, right? And mm -hmm. even ageism to yourself, if, mm -hmm. if I'm making any sense, like yeah. you you tend to tend to feel like oh, I'm too old to not know, or I'm too old to be slumming it as a fresh grad. Yeah. How did you How did you overcome it? Was it just because you you felt like I didn't have a choice, or was it like? I mean, were there anything that helped make that transition better? I think that uh, not having the choice, getting back to even the first time uh, where I didn't think I had a choice for not riding a bike. I didn't think I had a choice for not learning how to use a stupid pump. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this pump. Yeah. Uh, that, was a, that was a fun, <laughs> fun story for another yeah. time. But I th think that... Um, feeling that you can do it at any age. It's the growth mentality. Like that's becoming kind of a trendy uh, topic. Enter everything with a growth mentality. It's not about age. Um, I ended up starting my MBA at 35. Very nice. Um, at an elite school around 25 year olds, 27 year olds. I had two kids when I started my MBA. Wow. As a woman in... Uh, business school so I met a lot of fathers I'd only met other one other woman who yeah. was a mother so that is an ageism thing I got into tech at 42 I entered technology even though I have an engineering degree it was more on the civil side it wasn't technology I entered tech at 42 and I I understand it and I, I feel like I know some of it now so but having I do think that having a growth mentality at any age we all know the 65-year-old or the 75-year-old who learned how to, I don't want to say learned how to code, yeah. but knows how to use a phone. Right. <laughs> you know, my father is still not that great at using a phone, but my yeah. mom is great at it. And she's learning and she gets frustrated. And But that to me at any age, um, the growth mentality does uh, overcome whatever you have to learn at any age. I right. think that's really important for anyone doing a career transition is like you just have to feel that you want to do this and it's exciting. If it's a drag and you feel that you know you have other options that are that ha having no options absolutely helps. I think that, you know, makes forces a lot of people to do it, but you have to also enter it thinking that you want this. And you know, cuz growth mentality means so many things to so many people. I'm curious what growth, mental growth mentality means to you. I think that it mean, growth mentality to me means thinking, learning new things is a good thing. That we are always changing. We always talk about change management and transformation. Looking at that and seeing the good of that, mm -hmm. I think is a growth mentality. Because even though you might be resistant to something and not want it, you you'll have to adapt and change. But that's not a that's not a positive thing. Right. It's it's always looking forward to changes. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think um, I I feel a, an important part of growth mentality also involves not competing against anyone but yourself, mm -hmm. because because um, I I remember because I. I because I, as part of this podcast and stuff, I started to learn how to build an app. And I used to be re get really frustrated because, you know, 
you see other people who went to university and learn how to code and they do it so quickly and it was always so frustrating that you know I can't even get like a basic code right and I think you know just understanding that you know in order for you to grow it's really important not to compete with anyone except who you can be mm-hmm. and it took me a really long time to <laughs> to get to that but i feel that's important in growth mentality i agree so have you built your app <laughs> oh, i'm still i'm still struggling, still struggling you know but it's 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 uh it's something that i you know i know i i'm going to the goal is to actually build it so it's mm-hmm. not it's not like i won't but i think like i'm also um i'm also conscious of all the things i can do for free while i'm still you know getting there and you know like doing a podcast and you know cuz the i mean the app was also to do some of the same things i'm doing through the podcast which is really to help people you know improve their mental well-being you know at the workplace etc so it's kind of like a congruently doing <laughs> doing it simultaneously but really slow at it <laughs> so i think it's interesting you had said that you don't want to compete against other people i, I that's true i look at that also but i also look at it as hey if someone else can do it i can do it too it's true so yeah. that motivates me to no end in terms of it, and i don't look at them as being 21 year olds or or 81 years old if someone has done something yeah it's it that empowers me it's like oh if they can do it i can also do it i don't need to do it better than them but right. let me just do what they've done that's true so that helps a lot yeah, yeah. and um and before I forget as well I mean cuz you mentioned you you did an MBA with um uh with two kids uh in tow mm-hmm. um so it sounds like you also had a a, a very supportive family mm-hmm. throughout that process so um and number one was is my assumption true and yeah. number two um how important is support through all these adversities So getting back to be a career and I think for men and women actually um the most important I've heard this before and many of your audience might have heard this also in terms of the most important person for your career is going to be your spouse if if you are married if you choose to be married but I do I 100% agree with that because you will always have different bosses you will have different mentors you will have different sponsors in life but your spouse is your constant in your life and they 100% have to support you um and you have to support them in terms of how you will navigate 20 30 years of your career and hopefully your spouse also has a good growth mentality they support you in the right ways encourage you in the right ways course correct you in some ways too and my husband and I I think that I now understand what partnership is we've been married 17 years so actually that to me is still very short mm. and uh he supported me through my MBA I've supported him through his PhD both post kids after right. having kids uh he supported us to move to Singapore I've supported him uh when we moved to Chicago so all of these kinds of things I think is like you really build your partnership right so wow that is impressive yeah support is i i feel is fundamental mm-hmm. because um progress can be a very lonely road otherwise yeah. yeah um when you made the the change and then now you're in technology mm-hmm. um how did you overcome some of the challenges that that came with those transitions like for example um you know after like going to mba much later than yeah. your peers or when you um when you went into technology and you were sort of fresh in this environment yeah. um how did you what what was yeah how did you overcome some of that adversity As entering technology for 2 years i was a consultant there was a period in our time in our lives when my husband was getting his phd so he said okay we need to make a lot of money i need to make a lot of money so to support us through this time what can we do it's like well that was easy let's go into consulting <laughs> so <laughs> went to consulting um and it was uh some kind of um you know enterprise system installment in these large companies and so i i knew nothing at that point in time actually 
I felt like the company needed warm bodies, smart people, and warm bodies because it was just volume of work. And so I entered it and it was the same thing. I was in my 40s then, after an MBA, thinking I was smart, sitting beside 30 year olds. So exact same scenario <laughs> I've been yeah. putting myself into it other times in my life. Embarrassed, you know, in some ways, because I'm no longer a 30 year old sitting beside 20 year olds. Like at that, you can still kind of fake it a little bit. You don't have kids <laughs> yet. Yeah. But now you're 40 and sitting beside 30 year olds. So, I, but it was similar in terms of, okay, you sit down, you learn it, you listen to what they're saying and you have to feel like, yes, I'm not as fast and as, you know, I still felt not as quick as everybody, but I still kind of got the picture of it. It's not rocket science, it's just numbers. Right. And so that was hard. A lot of it is just getting over the fact that you're not like them, but you can do what they do. So that is, I would say that was the hardest part of it. The work itself is it's just work. Right. It's, not, it's not rocket science. It's getting over the fact that you feel different. You're not, you don't look like them or talk like them and, and all of that. But at the end of the day, where did I gravitate towards? I gravitated towards more on managing the team, making sure everyone's happy, um, making sure that the client side understood what we were doing. So I did a lot of the translations because as I was learning this technical work, it's like I had to make it into my own words. I had to frame it in my own mind. Oh, this is what you mean. And I would help translate that back to the client so that is where I ended up gravitating towards in those two years is being a bit more on the client liaison. Right. So as much as I needed to code, I did a little bit of coding, but then hey, a lot of my time was also spent coming back to the, to the client. So you gravitate a little bit more towards where you're good at. Um, if you can, you know, if you can it, uh, position yourself that way. Right. So that's actually how I ended up succeeding in that role in terms of, um, I learned a little bit, I learned enough to be useful, but then I found myself useful in other ways in the same project. Right. So, yeah. Is that yeah. is that what you would advise um, people in similar situations like you? You know, you find yourself older than the rest, um, maybe different in some way to the rest of the, the pack. Mm -hmm. um, just, you know, find something that you gravitate towards and just pursue that. Regardless. Try to grab. Yes, I would say if that is something that you can do, it's find the opportunity. Absolutely, find the opportunity where there's a gap somewhere. So maybe the client is frustrated. So therefore, okay, see where the you know where you can help in that side. Um, right. I, yes, absolutely. Or if you find that you end up being great at coding, you know, be part of that team yeah. as well. Yeah. Interesting. Um, final question, um, is how, how many kids do you have? I have two kids. Okay. So being a mom of two, um, two girls, yeah, two girls, um, and having gone through career transitions and because, you know, in the modern world of either, um, automation or just the nature of work mm -hmm. transitions would probably be more frequent than mm -hmm. we would like to accept, um, what advice would you give them regarding the uncertainty of jobs in the future and the op opportunities that may come from it? I think that having diverse interests is it infinitely helpful because as you transition between anything, it's always it's almost a different focus area. So if you only have an interest in one area, but even as you get deep into that one interest area, there's definitely different paths to take. Um, I think just being able to, you know, it, it, it's so hard to define what being adaptable is, being agile, or <laughs> being, um, you know, open to change. Because, you know, what does that mean? Like, what am I doing next week? What am I doing tomorrow? What, what does that mean? So... I think having a lot of diverse interests is, is really, really helpful. Um, surrounding yourself by people who have different interests as well and then being open to different opportunities. Um, being uncomfortable, I think, is something that more people need to be, to experience. Right. And I think, and being uncomfortable and overcoming that is something that I feel like I 
I have so much experience with. So I think having more people be uncomfortable and, and overcoming that as opposed to being uncomfortable and pulling yourself out. I think that's a, that's a conscious decision that I, I feel like I've put myself in many times, maybe because I didn't have any options. So that's something that I would like, I would love to see more in the new generations as well. Um, and one of the reasons why I did, you know, we moved our family out to Singapore uh, halfway around the world is like to have kids have a little of discomfort, have a little bit of discomfort. Um, trying new things, realizing they have no choice. They have to make new friends. So that would be something I would definitely like to teach them to seek out new things um, when something is very comfortable. Our lives were amazing in, in Chicago and we just picked up and we moved somewhere. Let's, right. let's mix that up a little bit. I think that's, that's really good. Yeah, for people. powering through the discomfort. <laughs> yeah. Words to live by, I guess, <laughs> especially in the new world, you know, because um, I, 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 I've had conversations with uh, my wife and, you know, she and because and, she's in engineering and she talks about automation. And and sometimes I wonder, like, I wonder what I'll be doing in, you know, in 20 years, like who really knows? So, yeah. Thank you for that. I really enjoyed this conversation, Alex. <laughs> uh, Thank so, you. This was an incredible opportunity. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, thanks. And uh, hopefully our listeners will really take take comfort in the fact that, you know, someone went from um, a weekend warrior, in your own words, to an Olympic. Uh, you placed fifth, right? If I'm No. Uh, at the Olympics, I placed 27th. 27th, yeah. Out of 30. Okay. I'm still um, incredibly proud to represent Hong Kong. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and I know that it, it was a huge opportunity to just have some other uh, minority women also representing uh, represented at an elite sport like that. Perfect, yeah. And uh, were you the only female uh, athlete who uh, in cycling with, to represent Hong Kong yes. at that time? Yes, yeah. I have been. So, yeah, so... Weekend yeah. warrior, <laughs> Olympic, yeah. uh, Olympic cyclist, mm -hmm. and then transitioning to a career in technology. So, yeah, I'm sure people will be inspired by that. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. you.